guys, we're just going to start. Watch your cell phones, please. Tell me when, Bill. Anytime. Okay, thank you. I, I am just so blessed to be back with you guys. Um, I'm so glad that uh, obviously the announcement that I was speaking today didn't scare too many people away. <laughs> so I, I feel really blessed, really. And I do have some special guests that, of friends of mine who came, and I just want to introduce them to you. Ron Newman, could you stand up, Ron? one of the main leaders of Messianic Judaism in Brevard County. Yeah. And he leads an organization called Jew Jewish Followers of Jesus. Um, it was kind of a, it's a spin-off of Jews for Jesus. He used to run Jews for Jesus in Brevard County. And uh, he also has his own congregation. He, he's just such an amazing, godly man. So please get to know him. And then we have my friend, B.C. Schubert. Who is a retired dentist, but he hasn't, he, he says that my, my teeth look okay, so he's going <laughs> to operate on me. And Doug Scopia. Our fellow gym rats at Pro Health. And we, we talk about the Lord all the time. It's really wonderful. And then Tom Pierce. Pierce Tom Pearson. Yeah. Tom is a neighbor of mine, and I come by his place to pay my respects to him every morning, pretty much. And so anyway, those are my special friends who came here, and, I, and you're all my special friends, so I thank you so much. And I see Alan Prevola, who's another special friend. Thank you for coming, Alan. Thank you. And Alan, you know, comes here quite often, but I told him he'd better come to this, because this is a very special presentation. Most of you know that that I was born Jewish. My wife and I are both 100% Jewish, and we're also 100% Christian. Amen. Amen. And uh, at the end of this presentation, you're going to really understand why I can say that. Uh, because Christianity is truly Jewish. Amen. Uh, so at the end of this presentation, I'm going to try to answer the following questions. What was God's original plan for the relationship between Jews and Gentiles? He had a plan. And how did Christianity become a religion? Was the new religion actually God's intention? And what has been the relationship between Christianity and Judaism throughout history and today? So those are the questions that I hope to answer, and I think you're going to find this very revealing. Amen. Uh, because I really do believe that God had me give it, when Bill asked me to give a presentation, it was like God put on my heart just to, <laughs> immediately to give this presentation. Jewish Christianity. I mean, that, that's what God said. You are going to deliver this message. Amen. So anyway, recently, a group of Orthodox rabbis called Christianity, and I quote, part of a divine plan in which God would have Jews and Christians work together to redeem the world. Now, we, that's not exactly our mission to redeem the world. We have a redeemer to do that. But... It is really amazing that Orthodox rabbis would see the kinship, the proximity of, of Jews and, and Christians. And as I'm going to be explaining to you, that's amazing because of all the anti-Semitism that exists and the, the traditional bad feelings that have existed between Jews and Christians. 
Now, one of those rabbis, Irving Greenberg, said, we understand there is room in traditional Judaism to see Christianity as part of God's covenantal plan for humanity as a development out of Judaism that was willed by God. So that, you know, that's pretty remarkable. So, although there's a lot of controversy and disagreement uh, between Jews and Christians and theologians about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, there's one thing that can never be denied, and that's the close kinship of Jews and Christians. And you're just going to see how close that kinship is. We are truly one in Christ. And you're going to very clearly see that. As Galatians 3.28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, and you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are one. All the distinctions that we've made, including the religious distinctions, are artificial. So we all understand that there's no distinction between believers, but few people realize just how closely related Judaism and Christianity are. God's plan was never for the founding of religions. God didn't ordain religions. Religions are man's devices to form and maintain a relationship with God because we thought it was necessary to go through all these religious rituals to achieve that. And in fact, do you know what the first organized religion was? Babel. When men came together to try to reach God because they didn't have faith that God would reach them. So the Tower of Babel was in fact the first religious device. <coughs> So God's plan has always been about forming and maintaining a relationship with us. That's always been the purpose. I mean, from the moment when he created man in the, and, and woman in the Garden of Eden, it was all about relationship. Amen. So from the initial relationship with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that that has been God's master plan to perfect his relationship with his creation. Now, most of the religious problems that we have today are due to the fact that very few people understand the big picture of the Bible. And that's one of my missions in life is to try to help people see the big picture and not get hung up on the details. So, what was God's plan? God knew that Adam and Eve would fail. A lot of people think that, you know, God was surprised when Adam and Eve sinned against him and ate, you know, the, the forbidden fruit. But absolutely not. God knows everything, is all powerful. He is not surprised by anything that happens. Right. So, I think I shared with you previously one of the really great insights that God has given me, and that is when God created man and woman, he could create everything perfect except for two things. Do you remember what those two things are? No, no, they, they had perfect choice that got them into trouble. No, it's love and wisdom. Think about it. Can you create perfect love? You can't. Love has to be developed over time. You can't create love. You can't just say, okay, let there be love. That's the whole process of biblical history is about developing love. And that's Jesus' message. But there had to be an awful lot of development that, had, that we had to go through before we were ready to receive Jesus' message and to really understand what true love is. 
which was, of course, demonstrated by him. The other thing is wisdom. You can't just say, let there be wisdom. I mean, you know, how many years have we all worked at trying to become wise? And the Bible is full of, you know, wisdom books and all kinds of wisdom. But it takes time for wisdom to do. So those were the two things. And so Adam and Eve were sitting ducks to Satan, who obviously knew about love, but didn't have love. But he did have something that Adam and Eve didn't have. He had wisdom. Because Satan had been around, the serpent had been around for a very long time and had developed a lot of wisdom. And so how were these innocent, newly created beings going to succeed against this brilliant, evil force? And the answer was, they couldn't, and God knew they couldn't. But that was all part of his plan. God had a perfect plan. It wasn't plan B. It was plan A for the permanent redemption of mankind through the sacrifice of his son, the Jewish Messiah. So once God had cleansed the world after the flood, and I don't want to go into all the, the mess that existed before the flood, but God knew that evil, you know, that evil forces were going to take over and he was going to have to do a cleansing process. God selected, carefully selected, individuals who would be part of faithful remnants. And that's what the Bible is all about. It's about God selecting and having a relationship with a relatively few faithful people who made up faithful remnants. And you know what a remnant is? A remnant means residual. After you get rid of all the chaff, you're left with the wheat. That's the residual. <coughs> and unfortunately, there was a lot of chaff along the way. In fact, I don't think you realize this, but in the Old Testament alone, there are 540 mentions of remnant or words that mean remnant. So remnant is a very, very important concept. So God chose the Jewish people to be the messengers through which his revelation to mankind and the savior of the world would come. But remember, all the Jewish people were not faithful, just like all Gentiles, all Christians are not faithful. So all through history, God has nurtured his relationship with remnants. You all are part of a remnant. Right. You know that everybody you know who calls themselves a Christian is not a real Christian. Not all Christians are part of a faithful remnant. Not all Jews are part of a faithful remnant. Right. So God, don't get frustrated. That's part of God's plan, is building out from the faithful remnants to build his kingdom of faithful remnant people. As Galatians 4, 4 says, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. And who did he send his son to first? The Jews. But God knew that the Jewish people would not be able to fulfill the mission that they had without assistance. And that's why God chose Paul to recruit Gentiles to be his tag team for the Jews. So the you know you know like in a relay race is that what Paul what God did is he had Paul recruit Gentiles to carry on where the Jews had left off and temporarily the Jews were put aside but only temporarily. And then it was always God's plan from the beginning that the Gentiles, because he, you know, one of the things that we don't realize, but if you think about it, you realize it, is it's so much easier to get people who don't have something that they're holding on to to change. Right. 
And so the reason why the Jewish people have been so resistant to this new <coughs> message, to the gospel, is because they were so locked in to their old paradigm. But the Gentiles really had nothing. So, it, so the Jews, had, and, and Ron knows this very well, that when you, when you witness to Jews, the first thing you have to do is get them to uh, learn their resistance, Amen. which is Judaism, traditional Judaism, which has nothing to do with God's plan per se. It's a religion, right. and it's very resistant to change. But the Gentiles were mired in all this pagan nonsense. And so it was very easy for them to accept this new and exciting message. So, um, God turned the unbelief of the Jews into a blessing for the Gentiles. And that's why we have to love Jewish people. Because the Jewish people, remember, the Jewish people get handed off the baton to you so that you could carry on the race. But they were the foundation. They ran the first two legs of the relay race. And now the Gentiles are carrying on. But God knew that, the, that, that this was going to happen from the very beginning. Okay, the bottom line is biblical history, both Old Testament and New Testament, is about faithful individuals and faithful remnants doing their part to contribute to the fulfillment of God's preordained plan. Everything in the plan. Now, God doesn't micromanage every little thing, but his plan, what we see played out in the big picture of scripture was preordained. He was not surprised by the unfaithfulness of humanity. Okay, now the artificial separation of the Bible into two testaments with 400 years in between is totally artificial. And that's one of the things that has caused anti-Semitism and caused this sense that Jews are one thing, Gentiles are, you know, Christianity is another, and the two really don't have much relationship. When in fact, the New Testament is just a continuation of the Old Testament. Right. And the fact that there were 400 years in between, there was a reason, and that's another teaching. I won't get into that now. But it really is amazing if you really look at the flow of biblical history in terms of what I just shared with you, it is pretty amazing. And the new co covenant is just a continuation of the old covenant. It isn't totally new because what is the new covenant? The new covenant essentially is the internalization of the law. Jesus didn't, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. Amen. That Amen. law is filled, is fit. we are filled up with the law of God. Amen. But Jesus' codification of that law, not the, the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. So. And are you going to elaborate on that? I can't. I can't teach on everything today. If you want me to come back and teach on specific things. Because Jesus simplified it. Yeah. Right. Oh, he had, he, he, right. He, he boiled it all down to Absolutely. simple things. To two. To love, exactly. love God and love your neighbor. Right. And if you look at the Ten, ten Commandments, that's all they say, essentially. Absolutely. Right. And the 613 commandments of the, the Jewish people. Okay. So Jesus was not against the law, only the manner in which it was being used. That pretty much answers your question. Jesus was asked, what commandment is the first of all? He answered in Mark 12, 28 through 31, with the Shema. The Shema is the famous Jewish oath of loyalty to God. Amen. And it's, uh, it's listed in, in Leviticus 19.18. <laughs> and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it goes on. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then Jesus added, 
The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. He didn't say there were no other commandments. He was saying that there are no other commandments greater than these. So this is really what Christianity is all about. The new movement we call Christianity, remember, was led by Jews. A small band of faithful Jewish men and women were the ones who followed Jesus. For the first few years of the church's existence, only Jews believed in Jesus as Savior. That's right. It was not until Acts 10 that Gentiles, non-Jews, received the Holy Spirit. The first Gentile believers were Cornelius and his family. Until then, it was all Jewish people. But that's the shift that took place, the handing off of the baton. But it did not take long after that before Gentiles outnumbered the Jews. The mission to the Gentiles, led by Paul, it was so successful that there was explosive gro growth in Christianity. Now, let me give you some figures here. In the year 33, which is postulated as the year Jesus died and was resurrected, there were, before the resurrection, there were 50 believers. After the resurrection, what I call AR, BR and AR, uh, there were 500, and that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Then in the year 35, two years later, the year of the Jerusalem church, and when, they when, when, when this new movement started to become organized, that Jerusalem church, or ecclesia, was founded with about 120 Jews and Jewish proselytes. Proselytes. They were all Jewish. Then in Acts 4.4, 4, it says that at that time, there were 5,000 believers. And Peter, Acts 2.41 says, Peter converted 3,000 people with one single sermon. So you can see that growth starting to happen. Then in the year 150, 150, there were approximately 40,000 believers. In the year 200, a quarter of a million, 250,000. In the year 250, a million. In the year 300, six million. And that's when things really started, when Christianity started taking root in the Roman Empire. And then Constantine, Emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity in the year 312 AD, and that's when things really started exploding. But that's exploding positively and negatively. And that was, so in the year 350, there were 34, mil, estimated to be 34 million Christians. Of course, they weren't all real believers. And then today, there's 2.2 billion Christians. So it's pretty amazing what happened. But a lot of people think that Christianity started at Pentecost. Isn't that what we're taught? You know, Pentecost is really the Jewish festival of Shavuot. Right. It was originally a harvest festival, but also commemorated the giving of the law, the Torah. And that's what made it so ironic that the, the spirit was given on the same day that the law had been given. So the law was internalized at the same day of the Jewish calendar that the law was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Wow. Uh, then, uh, so it should be clear to you that this was just a continuation of what had God had promised to do. Remember in Jeremiah 31, 31, and, and in lots of other scriptures, he talks about the giving of a new covenant that will be internalized. And this was a promise not to the Christians, not to the Gentiles, but to the Jewish people. But the Gentiles, of course, benefited from that, and we've gotten 
you know, Christians have gotten an early taste of that promise to the Jewish people. Uh, all people who received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost were Jewish. Every single one. And then this is unfortunately a primary example of how totally disconnected the history has, of Israel has become from Christianity. Christians have very little regard for Jewish people, not really realizing that even the church that they're so uh, part, much a part of um, was originated by Jewish people. Unfortunately, as it developed, Christianity has become a completely Gentile religion, all you know what I say, 99%, cut off from its Jewish roots. Christianity started out, remember, as the way, which was simply Jews following Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus is the way. And that's what Ron's organization is, about Jews following Jesus. But what is the difference between a Jewish person following Jesus and a real Christian? The difference is just the person of Jesus, the Messiah, right. and his teachings. Everything else was added by man. Now, there were a lot of other sects, including the Essenes and the Nazarenes, um, and gradually kind of they died out, and there became a mainstream of Christianity. But remember, the New Covenant was never supposed to be a completely new law. It was the law of Moses, codified by Jesus, and written in the hearts of believers through the Holy Spirit. That's it. No new religion. Just <laughs> Jesus internalized. That's what it's all about. When you strip away all the man-created stuff, that's what it is. We have the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus, inside of us. Um, the early Jewish Christians saw no contradiction between their faith in Jesus and the law of Moses, and early Christians generally used and revered the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. Around 48 or 49 CE or AD, Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem for a conference, the famous Jerusalem conference that's talked about in Acts 15. Uh, and the question there was, should we let Gentiles in to this totally Jewish church, and under what conditions? At that time, the only requirements to be a believer were to accept Jesus and be baptized. That's it. So the discussion of the Jerusalem Council centered on certain things like circumcision, Jewish dietary laws, and whether or not Jews could share a meal with Gentiles. You know, that's the religious kind of stuff. And ultimately, James, who was the leader of the council, made the final decision. And what he said is, let's not make it difficult for Gentiles who want to turn to God. And we shouldn't make it difficult for Jews who want to turn to God Amen. by putting up all these artificial barriers. Amen. Gradually, unfortunately, there was a parting of the ways between Jewish and Gentile factions of this Christ-centered movement. The separation intensified during the second century and people like Justin Martyr, an early Christian apologist, and Ignatius, a Christian writer who later became the Bishop of Antioch, perpetuated those differences. And a whole literature started developing which was anti-Jewish and pro-Christian -Chri religiosity and started adding all these additional things. And of course, when Constantine made Christianity the Roman state religion, things really started getting off track and that's when all of these religious things, <coughs> addendums, were added, none of which are fundamental to our faith. A variety of Christianities even developed during the second and third centuries, but 
sects that failed to accept the established doctrines, which were often unbiblical, were thrown out of the movement. Gradually, there became Judaism for the Jews and Christianity for the Gentiles. And then, uh, you know, that was totally contrary to Jesus' command recorded in John 10, 16, that there be one flock and one shepherd. In reality, the only difference between true Judaism, and again, Judaism as we see it today, has so much man created around it, but true Judaism is just reverence for the fundamentals of the law of, and love of God. Um, and true Christianity in the person of Jesus Christ. So there really is no difference, but the differences were accentuated and the similarities were downplayed. And it's just like we find today in negotiations, you know? If we want to get together with people, we focus on the similarities. If we want conflict, we focus on the differences. And so Judaism and Christianity have been in conflict for centuries because of the focus on differences. So there were people who began to be threatened by Jews, and there were also satanic influences that popped up, and that led to rampant anti-Semitism. And remember, it all goes back to Genesis 3.15. And I will put en enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The battle lines were drawn and the Jews got caught in the middle of the war. The war between Christianity and Satan. Now, there's an amazing book called The Anguish of the Jews, but there's lots of other books, that samples, I mean, this book has in it thousands of examples of anti-Semitism over the ages. Thousands. And you know, we think about, when we think of anti-Semitism, we mostly think of the Holocaust. The Holocaust was not the worst of it. There had been more millions of Jews killed before the Holocaust than during the Holocaust. The first case of anti-Semitism was at Purim, what we celebrate as Purim, at 475 BC, when Haman attempts genocide against the Jews. Then there were the early Christian attacks on Jews as Christ killers. Almost as soon as Christianity came into existence, the Jews were were called Christ killers, and that really accentuated the hatred. Then there were pogroms in so many European countries, anti-Jewish laws, burning Jewish, uh, burning Jewish books, and banning Jewish practices. There were massacres of Jews all across the Byzantine Empire. Jews were blamed for plagues, like the Black Plague. It was the Jews' fault. The Jews were blame for economic downturns. We see that today. Jews were expelled from cities. You know, one of the things I discovered that we don't realize is the anti-Semitism in France was actually worse than the anti-Semitism in Germany. And the anti-Semitism in Italy was also terrible. So Jews were expelled from cities all over Europe. There were forced conversions. Then there was the Inquisition which basically destroyed any remnants of Judaism in, the, in Spain and the Spanish, Spanish colonies. There were 250,000 Jews massacred in Morocco. And then there was all this anti-Semitic literature, including Martin Luther. Martin Luther's sermon called Admonition Against the Jews contains accusations of ritual murder, black magic, and poisoning of wells. 
Luther recognizes no obliga either no obligation to protect Jews in any way. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the founder of Protestantism, basically. Mm -hmm. so, and then, of course, there was the Holocaust. And today, there's still constant anti-Semitism. So I hope it takes your breath away a little bit. What you, and, and to help you understand a little bit why Jews might be resistant to Christianity is because they see Christianity as not Jesus Christ, not God who loves them, but the institution that has hated them for thousands of years. <laughs> so in summary, above all, we must never forget Jesus was born a Jew. He was a child of Jewish parents. He was brought up in a Jewish home around Jewish traditions. He observed the law. He was born Jewish, lived Jewish, and died Jewish. And Christianity is a continuation of Judaism. At its roots, Christianity is Jewish. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Comments? Yeah. First observation, you should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> secondly, the, and if I look at the first century in the church that, that James was leading, and then try to follow those people through history, uh, what happened to them? Because our only history is Paul's what happened to them, and again, you know, this was part of God's tag team. And it was part of his plan, unfortunately, you know, people had to suffer for, you know, for the, re for the final victory. But what happened to them is the Gentiles took over and the, the, the church was, a formal church, an organized religion was developed, which was probably perpetuated by satanic influences. And the early, church, Jewish church just went away. And it just, it just was, you know, it just, it had no power behind it. And so what happened is the Jews, you know, the, the Jews became Christians and were diluted into the Christian church. And so that faithful remnant didn't exist, of Jews didn't exist anymore. And other Jews just went back into traditional Christianity. But today, we have a powerful church that has so much potential to do good and to reconcile the, the rift between Jews and Christians. And that's why I started off by sharing with you the, those comments by the Orthodox Jews, which gives us hope that there is reconciliation in the wind. Yes? Well, and now Christians are becoming to enjoy some of the discrimination that the Jews have for centuries. You're right. And there's another thing happening, Bill, and that is a lot of Christians are discovering their Jewish roots. But the negative part of that is that they're often encouraged to go back to Torah and live under the law rather than live in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Right. Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, Amen. and because that's what it's all about. It's Amen. not about the law. I mean, you know, those people who are trying to live under the law, it's stupid Amen. because what that means is they're saying, we don't really have the Holy Spirit directing us because the law is internalized. So why are they trying to follow an external law? It just doesn't make any sense. Amen. So again, there's so much stupidity and so that goes back to my comment about wisdom has to be developed and that's why it's so important for us to get into scripture to not focus on a lot of this what we call in judaism mishigas that's a yiddish word meaning craziness because it's all you know the words of jesus are what we should be living and the example of jesus is what we should be living by that's true christianity <laughs> Everything else is chaff. We've got to focus on the wheat. Amen.
Yeah, I was going to make a comment yeah. about that because <clears throat> as Christians now, since we've been peasants to the baton, should we then be celebrating the feast and all these things? And I know someone that actually has gone back to what you just said about those Jewish uh, roots, and they do celebrate the feast, and they want to, you know, stay away from pork and all these other things. That, okay. So there, there's so. two things that you mentioned there that are important. One is celebrating the feast. There are certain feasts that are very important to uh, the prophetic uh, um, re revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, they were in fact uh, things that happened that pre-ordained or, or pre-envisioned that Jesus would come. But, uh, and that's good. But, if you feel that you have to do it, if your salvation depends on it, if the love of God depends on it, then you're back under the law, under the old covenant. Amen. And you don't want that. Amen. So, there's nothing wrong with celebrating your Jewish heritage, it's all how you do it. And again, that's what Jesus rebelled against, and that's why he criticized so harshly the Pharisees, is because they wanted everybody to live in bondage under the old covenant law, and they didn't understand the freedom that exists in Messiah, and they don't un didn't understand that there were two commandments that were important, not 613. So they, again, you know, what I said earlier is I believe part of my mission in life is to help people see the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the Bible, and not get hung up on the details like the Pharisees did. And the same thing's true for Christians who want to celebrate their Jewish heritage. Let's not lose the big picture Amen. for the details. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, there was a question? Yes, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that you were Jewish and born into a Jewish family. What experience or education or uh, what motivated you to pursue your understanding of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity? Well, it was, you know, I, I've got a, um, if you're interested in my testimony, give me your email address and I'll send you, yeah, it's very interesting. But basically I was searching, you know, Hebrews 11.6 says, uh, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Amen. him. And I always diligently sought God, often in the wrong places, including Hinduism and Buddhism. But if you're seeking God, God will find you. Right. And so that's what so that's what we find is that people who are genuinely seeking the truth are going to find the truth. It's a personal question, but at what age did you? I say, at what age did you oh, come to this? Uh, it happened forty years ago, so I was like twenty-two. Well, thank you. Thank you. But. You know, again, it was a process, but I mean, it's just, it had, you know, I just feel so blessed to be, as I said at the beginning, 100% Jewish and 100% Christian. Yes. I mean, oh, it's fantastic. And, then, and to know the difference. <laughs> it's, like, you know, it's like the Alcoholics Anonymous. You got to know the difference. I'm sorry, was it, Ron, did you have a question? I think as we get older, we fail to mentor. You know, God has blessed us with a lot of knowledge and wisdom, but that's the reason why I don't like to go to the store where they have cell phone salaries. I like to talk to people and ask them how they're doing today, you know, what can you do for them, and, you know, share with them. And we got vast knowledge on the Internet. You can get anything you want to, but if you don't know how the knowledge to do what this is, then it doesn't really right. matter. But just remember, we don't save people. God right. saves right. people. We want to save you. But, and so our responsibility is to plant seed Amen. and God will nurture that seed right. if there's fertile ground. But just remember what I said is it's all about Faithful individuals and faithful remnant 
those who are diligently seeking him will be rewarded by God. So don't lose any sleep over those people who are going to hell. I mean, I mean really, I, I mean, I know that's probably a radical thing to say, but if you do worry too much about it, you're gonna lose a lot of sleep. And just remember, God is just and faithful. So let me pray. Father God, I just pray for these wonderful men, and I just pray that this message that I shared will sink deeply into them and that they'll realize what the truth is of Judaism and Christianity and the relationship between them mm -hmm. and God's plan for God's perfect plan for humanity. And I just thank you so much for this opportunity to fellowship and we love you and praise you. And one more thing that I forgot to mention is there will be no fuel here next Thursday for the 4th of July. Uh, by the way, uh, Mike Urso, you go to Chick-fil-A over here, he's a manager, uh, he'll be the speaker on the 11th. As stated, there will not be a meeting next week, 4th of July.